Hello. I mean, you've already said hello to you, or hello to you. Uh, hello to you watching online. I'm David. I'm the coordinator of the Mass Learning Centre here. Uh, and this is a tradition at the beginning of a revision seminar so that you can see what I look like. So now you see. Uh, we, we probably won't see my face again. Depends. Uh, there won't be much call to do floor graph sorts of things in this one, I reckon. So you probably won't see me. Um, I think the revision seminar I've been seen most in is the, the uh, multivariable calculus seminar from last semester where I was crawling around on the floor a lot making models. So if you do multivariable calculus next, sem next year, then have a look. Uh, okay, so this is a revision seminar for statistical analysis and modeling, um, affectionately known as SAM. Uh, and um, I am currently having a conversation with the students about what's in SAM. I was pretty sure, uh, but I just wanted to check. Um, so um, the only request I've that, that has been given to me by the time I got here was ANOVA, um, and that's fine, I can talk about ANOVA, uh, but I was just checking what the lie of the land and the rest of the course is. Uh, so how do people feel about the course? <laughs> We've got some, some grimaces, some eh. So, okay, it's good to know <laughs> how we feel. Um, and uh, for whoever wrote this or whoever else, what sorts of things did you want to know about ANOVA? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> you don't know? Who wrote it? Ah. The Anova table, cool. All right. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Has your lecturer given you like a practice exam or something? Um, cool. Might be worth having a look at that too to gauge sort of what her general level that she's working on is. So if anyone has one of those somewhere on a device, I'd love to look at it at some point soon. <laughs> or a printed version if you happen to have one. I don't have access to this my uni course, so I can't look it up myself. Okay, so um, what I want to say is this is your revision seminar. Um, I will talk about nothing unless you ask me. And, and we've got two hours for you to, ish, for you to ask me stuff, um, and I will continue talking about things as long as you ask me for things to talk about. But otherwise I won't say anything, because right, I you know, with Maths 1B, I could probably make a good guess as to what people wanted and just talk. But this course, not so much, because uh, this only happens once a year. Maths 1B happens three times a year. I've got a very good idea about what people want to know about it. So um, please ask. The rules are that you can interrupt me if I make a mistake. Um, always interrupt me if I've made a mistake, um, as soon as you can, um, so especially minus signs. Um, and you can also, um, you know, interrupt me if uh, you think of something, you know, I get to the end of a sentence and I pause and you go, so uh, what does that mean or what would happen if or um, is this similar to this other thing? Any of those questions are fine and it's your revision seminar so um, I don't really want you to, you know, be too polite to me about, you know, me getting on a train of thought. It's okay if you say, no, that's not actually, actually what I wanted. Could you try this instead? Um, okay? Cool. So I can talk about ANOVA um, and I will. So um, I have one question uh, before I start. Was the phrase ANOVA mentioned in more than one situation in this course? Sorry? Two-way two ANOVA, that was mentioned. And one-way ANOVA, and they're both in the course. Okay. Uh, did the lecturer mention ANCOVA? Okay, good to know. Now ANCOVA means different things in different courses. So I may have to find out what your lecturer thinks it means uh, before I talk about that. But they're all related to each other. Um, and they're all ultimately a kind of regression, really, um, which I'm hoping your lecturer said in this course, probably, hopefully. Yes, OK. And because in, in R, you do them all as like LM if you want. OK, good. Just making sure I've got the deal. Right. OK. Whew, cool. Uh, so um, I may 
flail around for a minute or two before I get the groove on this. Um, and if anyone has found that, that practice exam, I'm happy to look at it um, at any moment. So whenever you find it, let me know. Okay. So um, ANOVA uh, at its heart is a kind of hypothesis test. Um, what some people call a significance test, or well, you know, a thing that produces a p-value. Um, so I, I'm looking for confirmation with you because it's, it's, it's important. So and it's short for analysis of variance. So like a n o v, which is uh, actually rather an interesting way to um, turn this into an acronym, I find. So it's short for analysis of variance. Um, and interestingly, uh, the actual way of doing a one-way ANOVA in, in R is to go AOV instead of ANOVA, but you can do ANOVA as well, but that's reserved for something else. So it's a bit confusing in R, actually. Um, but uh, it's a kind of hypothesis test. It's short for analysis of variance, which is a description of the way that you go about producing um, the test statistic. Okay. So it describes how you produce the test statistic. <coughs> and you produce the test statistic by analyzing variances. And that's how you do it. And in particular, you produce the test statistic by dividing two variances. A variance divided by a variance. That's how it's done. Um, and in the probability theory in the background, whenever you calculate two variances and you divide them, you always get an F statistic. Um, not statistic, but you get something that follows an F distribution named after Fisher, who invented this process. Um, so that is what it's all about. So show how the two test statistic, um, which is like F, which is a variance divided by another variance. Okay. That's the idea. Uh, that's the most vague idea that you could have of this. Um, and it doesn't, and it is applies to any situation in which you calculate this. So, um, basically, and, and in particular, you are actually going to compare the amount of variation uh, that is explained by your model uh, to the amount of variation that is not explained by your model. That's what you're going to do. So this is the... So the amount of variation that's explained by the model divided by the amount of variation that's not explained by the model. Um, and you would like uh, that number to be as high as possible because you want the most amount of variation explained by the model. Because the whole point of statistics is to cope with variation. It's designed um, to, uh, to try and figure out why things are different and how they are different. And so um, we would like... Uh, the amount of how much are they different by explanation to be higher um, after we've figured out our model. Okay. Cool. Right. Let me see if I can get this right. Um, mm -hmm, just a moment. Okay. So take me a while to draw what I'm thinking about this. So ANOVA works um, on a numerical outcome. Your lecturer probably calls that quantitative. I'm not sure. Um, I call it numerical. It has to be a number. Every individual um, that um, you are measuring, and that they could be people or rats or chickens or trees or houses or countries, whatever they are, <coughs> they have a numerical outcome. And you can line them up.
You know, and these are all the different uh, numbers uh, that these outcomes produce for all possible individuals, or at the very least for the ones that are in your data. So that's the beginning. So this here is what happens when we have no explanation for this variation. So perhaps uh, we measure the amount of time uh, that university students spend with a dog during a week, right? Um, and there's a certain amount of variation in that. And, I mean, obviously you have to own a dog, so maybe we'll just have the dog owners and see how much time they spend with their dog. Um, and at the moment, there is no way for us to explain that. I mean, the classic that, that ANOVA was very first used for uh, was the, the amount of, you know, tons of wheat that you got off of your wheat field. It was the yield of wheat um, off, of, off a wheat farm. That's what ANOVA was first used for. Um, because Fisher was working in an agriculture rural research centre at the time. Um, so uh, these are all the things that it could be. And what it, the, um, it might be that there are some bits of information about these individuals um, that help to explain why the differences are here. So I'm just going to modify my picture by adding a few more dots to it. So this is like a jittered scatter plot at the moment. Like there's no x variable. There isn't an x variable at all. There's just like, you know, people. All right. So at the moment, what it looks like from the data is that there might actually be two separate groups of people that are causing these clumps here. There's a clump here and a clump here. Um, and all these people are sort of clustered around this bit and all these people cluster around this bit. So at the moment, um, the best estimate I have for the outcome for any one person is just the mean. If someone says to me, so, how much time do people spend uh, with, their, with their dogs? And I would go, well, uh, it's about this number, because that's somewhere in the middle. And that's the best estimate I could give them. But it may be with a little bit more information about the people, I could say, uh, well, um, if uh, they own a Labrador, uh, then they spend this amount, and if they own a Chihuahua, then it's this amount, right? So it might be that I can give a better estimate if I have some more information, and that's the idea of ANOVA. So at the moment, this is the mean of the whole group, and everybody is a certain distance from the mean. And if I add up all those distances, actually add up all the squares of those distances, then what I'll get is a variance. And what I want to do is want to take into account how many individuals there are. So I'm going to divide by how many individuals there are, minus one, because probability theory stuff. So all of these distances, uh, we can create a variance. And that variance is a measure of how much variation there is in this data. OK. So now what we do is then we have an explanation that maybe um, if actually there were like three different kinds of dog, for example, it may be that I can pull out the people that belong in this. So I can separate all these people in this clump and I can separate them based on which group they belong to. And so uh, some of these people end up here. And now it looks like perhaps knowing which category these things are in is helpful for um, making a prediction of what the mean is going, uh, of what a person's individual number is going to be. So now we go, do you know what? Actually, it does seem um, that there should be a separate mean for each group. And when someone says, what would I expect the time to be? I should look up my table and go, it's going to be this if you're in this group, this if you're in this group, and this if you're in this group. And so each of these has their own mean this time. And the amount of variation that's going on here is, well, how far is my estimate from the actual value that someone has? And that's all of these distances. 
And so those three together produce a variance of their own. Okay, we're doing quite well. These are not the two variances uh, that we're going to use. We are going to use this variance. That variance um, is uh, this denominator here. Okay, so here's the thing. For a single individual, the way to figure out, um, if I want to compare these two things together, if I want to use this as my basis to begin calculating this, then first I would know what the group mean is, and then I would know how far the group mean is from the big mean, like the big group mean is from the little group mean, and then I would know how far someone is um, from uh, their local mean. So just for an individual, here's a person here, and here is the, the grand mean, and here, I really should have used different colours, And here is their group mean. And so I could imagine that this difference that this person's number is from the grand mean is made up of a piece that is how far the group mean is from the grand mean and a piece uh, that is running out of colours and a piece that is how far uh, they, their individual measurement is from the group mean. And that is how you would progressively get a better and better estimate, right? You would say, okay, so at the moment this is how far they are from the grand mean and then I'll replace it with the group mean and this is how far um, they are now and we've gained, uh, we've lost this amount of variation. That's the amount of variation that we, that, well, that, uh, we don't need anymore uh, when we describe how far everybody is from their current estimate. And so this is called the variation that is explained by my story here. I should point out that I'm using two words here. There is variance, which is a calculation, and variation, which is a concept. This is the variation that's explained. Being in your group causes your group mean, causes your estimate to be different to the, to the estimate we had before, before we knew about the groups. And this is the variation unexplained. I didn't give myself space to write in texture there. Okay. And every individual has those bits of information. Now, technically, we're squaring all of these things, uh, <coughs> which means the adding up doesn't work quite the same way. But because we're averaging it across everybody, it all works out anyway. And if we're going to be technical technical, it's really a distance in multivariable space. Um, so linear algebra, like it's really, it's really like um, an orthogonal projection of one subspace onto another. Um, so that's what it really is. Uh, but we don't need to worry about all those details if we don't want to. Um, Fisher certainly never explained it at any great depth because he thought everybody else was stupid. So um, ultimately, not a very nice f person was Fisher to people that he thought was stupid, which was most people. Um, so, yeah. Sadly, I wish he was a nicer person. Um, of course, it doesn't matter, it matter anymore because he's dead, but... Um, <laughs> he died of tuberculosis because he moved to Adelaide. Sorry? He did because it was too cold here. So <laughs> like he caught tuberculosis in Adelaide when he moved here and he died. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so, there we go. So what we have to do is we have to calculate how far everybody is from their group mean and add up the squares of those things 
and we have to calculate how far all the group means, and for each person we have to figure out how far their group mean is from the grand mean, and add up all of those for every person individually, um, and then we, and, and those are the numbers that we need, and we're going to divide them by, by um, some numbers that sort of turn it into the correct distribution when we do the probability distribution theory. So, now we can set up that ANOVA table that you were talking about, okay? Uh, and this philosophy is going to be repeated in all kinds of ANOVA. Okay. So, um, now we're going to set up a table. Now, not everyone uses the same words for these, so it would be useful to be able to check against this. Are you looking at that now? Oh, damn it. <laughs> okay. So, we set up an ANOVA table. Uh, and it goes like this. Um, most places, um, the first column says source. Um, group error and total. Or possibly model error and total. Um, I'm not sure what's in this course. It would be useful to know at some point soon. as in the source of variation. Where does the variation come from? And so then you put here uh, the sum of the squared distances between the things you want the distances between. And so this is normally called SS for sum of squares. So if you want to hear a little bit of, of Fisher's reasoning here, the reason it's sum of squares is that when you find distances in, in like multi-dimensional space, you use Pythagoras' theorem. You add up the squares and then you square root the answer. Um, and so we're literally finding a literal distance in space from the, from the point whose coordinates are your data and the point whose coordinates are your estimates of your data. It's very cool. Anyway. That, it's really cool. So, yeah, I could draw that picture, actually. It's kind of cool. I will in a moment. So just a second. This is the actual data. The estimate. The estimate of the data. And this distance here is the sum of squares. This is uh, the square root of the sum of squares. So that's what f was in Fisher's head. There you go. That's what's in Fisher's head. OK. Uh, <laughs> So this is my new, my better estimate of the data, and there's actually another estimate somewhere else, which is the, um, which is the, the estimate that you have when you don't have any information. It's just the mean. Yeah. Okay. So you have your sum of squares, um, and um, that's what all these things are here. Uh, so the group one is this green one, and the error is this yellow one, and the total is the blue one. Okay. So um, I don't know what your lecturer writes in here. It's probably got like a sum of some sign, but when you do the ANOVA table, it just puts a number in that spot. Um, and so there will be numbers in this spot, in these spots here. And it will be true when you do this that this plus this should be equal to this. Okay, so it should be true. that whatever this number is plus whatever this number is should be equal to whatever this number is. Okay. 
And the next thing in the table is what that we call a degrees of freedom. And the phrase degrees of freedom is something to do with how much of the data you can change without changing um, the... If you don't change what the mean is, how many of the data points can you change without changing that mean? Uh, no, just a second. If you keep the mean the same, it's how many bits of data you know before the other ones you have to f you just figure it out. So if you, for example, if you, if you had like five, bit, five numbers and you knew the mean had to be 10, then once you knew what four of them was, then the other one you would have to, it would have to be a particular number for the, for the mean to come out to be 10. Uh, so that's the idea. Uh, but it's a little more complicated than that, um, and I just think of it as the distribution finder. It's the correct number I need to divide by in order for the thing that I do to be a correct chi-squared slash f distribution. So, um, yeah. That's what I call it. Okay, so the degrees of freedom right down here at the bottom sort of goes, well, if I, the, the estimate that I currently have, if I have none of this information about groups, the estimate I had was just the big mean. And if I know what the big mean is, then I can know all but one of, I can change um, all but one of the people's numbers before the last one is forced to be a certain number without changing the mean. So that's the idea. How many of them do I have the freedom to change if I want to keep the mean the same? And the answer is all but one. So this is the total number of people minus one. Or people or cats or, or chickens or houses or countries or whatever it is. Or petri dishes or days. Okay. All right. So this degrees of freedom, the group one, um, well, how, you know, each person has a number for how far their local group mean is from the grand mean, and I have to add them up for every person, and so that number is going to be included multiple times. But if I want um, the grand mean to still be the same thing with that calculation, since I'm only using the group means, I can change all but one of the group means. And so this will be the number of groups minus one. <coughs> Okay, and for the error, it's all the rest of the degrees of freedom. So we have n minus one degrees of freedom here, and g minus one degrees of freedom here. This has to be whatever's left over, which is n minus g. So the idea again is that this plus this equals this. Right, so let's just keep track of where we're going and I might draw on it again a second time. These three numbers are calculated from the data. But once you know any two of these, you can figure out the other one. These three numbers are calculated from the situation. It's how many people there are. Uh, oh, just uh, damn it. That's the number of individuals. How many individuals there are, how many groups there are. Uh, and so these two we can figure out, and this is just whatever's left over. Okay. <sighs> okay. Um, and then uh, the next column is MS, which stands for mean square error, like mean square, and that's this divided by that. So I think I need an even bigger table in a second. So it's the SS for the group divided by the degrees of freedom, and this is the SS for the error divided by the degrees of freedom. Now we don't actually need this one. This one's just here to be able to check that my answers are working out the way they should along the way. 
So if I have calculated these correctly, it should come out to the same answer as this when I add them together. So at the moment, these are just for checking that things are working properly. I don't need these to do the job I'm about to do. Now, these are the variances that we're talking about when we say analysis of variance. Right. They are variances. And a variance follows a chi-squared distribution. And when you divide two, two chi-squared distributions, you get an F distribution. Because every situation we could possibly imagine has a distribution, and some of them have names. And the name, that's what these are. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get an F statistic, and that is going to be, where are all my colored pencils? All right. And that's going to be this number divided by this number, and that answer is going to produce this answer here. Those dots really don't make any sense. All right, so I'm just going to do that again, but wider, so that there's more space. So here we go, one piece at a time. So this is the sum of each you actually probably wrote this in a box at some point on the lecture slides somewhere, maybe? No? Yeah. I don't know what she wrote here, but this is the individual measurement minus the Y bar for the group that you're in, squared, basically. No, crap. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The mean for this group minus the mean uh, for the entire uh, sample. And the error is the y for the individual minus the y bar for the group. And this is the y for the individual minus the y bar for everybody. So this is all. Right. So that's what that is. So that's the first step. And we know that this plus this comes out to this. If I add these two together, if I add these two together, it comes out to this answer. We know that. Okay. Um, this is just making me feel better, what I'm doing now. If it doesn't work for you, feel free to ignore it. But So now we have a number here and a number here and a number here. And then we have the degrees of freedom. So this is G minus 1. This is N minus 1. And this is N minus G. And we know that... Um, These two added together produces this one. Okay, that's the next layer of the thing. And then, if I had slides, I would probably make things appear as we went along. MS is this divided by that. And this divided by that equals that. That's how you do that. So we have numbers in these positions now.
and now this divided by this comes out to that answer there. Right, that's how you make the table. Much better than my first drawing which has all sorts of lines drawn everywhere. Okay. And if um, there's some normal distributions floating around, uh, then the F uh, is from an F distribution. Yeah. So the original data has to come from a normal distribution in order for you to be sure it's an F distribution. But if it is, this comes from an F distribution. So if... then that means that F is from an F distribution with uh, G minus 1 numerated degrees of freedom and N minus G denominated degrees of freedom. So um, the F distributions all live in a suburb of distribution city called F town um, and um, it's got street addresses which are these things. And so you go and you, you knock on uh, the door at this map coordinate and you say, so could you tell me a probability, please? Um, and that's how you figure out what the, what the p-value is. And so at this stage, you go, this is what an F distribution looks like. Uh, and you don't actually need the y-axis, nobody cares. This is what an F distribution looks like. Here's my F, and then this area here is the p-value. And it's always the top end uh, because um, well, A, it can't be negative for a start because you squared everything to get it, um, and B, uh, moving away from from the hypothesis that there is no relationship here at all just moves the F bigger. And so that's that. And you would ask R for um, the like 1 minus the F P P F. I can't remember how you do it. Um, but there's a thing that you would type into R to get that. Of course, there's a thing you would type into R to do this entire thing for you from the original data so that you don't have to calculate it yourself. That's the point of a computer program, um, to do stuff for you. And it will calculate a p-value all by itself. And so the final table actually doesn't just have an f there, it also has a p. And this is why I need to tell you and should have told you earlier that this, these notes will be online um, when the video is. Right, that's the final table. It has, sorry, all of that information in it. Ultimately, though, the point is not any of that stuff. I mean, that's just trying to show you, I mean, the reason they give you this information is so that you can have a good feeling about whether the computer's done its job properly. Okay, and in particular, this table was invented before computers, like in about the 1920s or 30s, um, and so the table was there so that you could make sure that the person who did it by hand did it properly. And that's way more important. Okay? So and that's why all of that information's there, um, so that you can check it's doing its job the way it is. Classic exam question that other lecturers have done is to give you an ANOVA table with bits rubbed out, and you have to fill in the gaps. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you've been asked those before, but it's, it's, it's a classic one that the lecturers use, have given for years and years. Um, and so you can, from um, these two bits of information and the information about um, how many, uh, from any two of these and the information about how many groups there are and how many individuals there are, figure out the rest of the table. Um, that's part of the idea. Okay, 
But the whole big thing is that this is fitting in with the general philosophy of hypothesis testing, which is that what you need to do is take your data and produce a single number from your data so that you can use it to make a decision. And this is the number we're looking for, this f. I mean, technically, this is the number we're looking for, the p, but anyway. The f um, that we're looking for here, we are imagining, what we're going to do is we're going to say, suppose, suppose being in a different group didn't really make a difference to what the, your estimate should be. So suppose that the best estimate um, for what a particular person's number is, regardless of which group you're in, is still this number, right? Which is really just supposing that there aren't really three groups. I can say that people have different kinds of dogs, but dogs aren't different enough to really do anything. So suppose that there is no relationship between these things. Suppose that this does not help. So if there is no relationship, it's really just one big group. And um, then I could imagine, if it really just is one big group, and then I imagine collecting this data again in all possible ways, and I think, what are all the possible F statistics if I did this whole process zillions of times? What are all the Fs that could have happened? And I will compare the F that I have to all the Fs that could have been. And that's what this picture is here. These are all the Fs that could have happened. And this height is how likely they all are. And this is mine. And these are all the Fs that are further away from mine. And so I would be even more surprised. So I know that if I did this experiment, these are all the Fs that could have happened. And these ones over here are pretty likely. And these ones over here are pretty unlikely. And these ones would be just as surprising because they're all unlikely. And so if I sort of add up how many of them there are, I think, right, that's how many of them are unlikelier than mine. And gosh, there's not very many of them. Mine must be pretty unlikely. So that p-value is sort of a, a percentage of how many Fs could have happened are more unlikely than mine. Um, and so you go, gosh, only 5%, only uh, maybe 3, only 3% 3 of the ones um, of the possible Fs are more unlikely than mine. Mine's pretty unlikely. So if mine's unlikely under the assumption that there's no relationship, maybe there is one after all. It's like a fancy proof by contradiction, but with probabilities. Because that makes them better, obviously. Um, so that's the idea. You don't actually have to say any of that. You can say, well, if the p comes up under whatever your thing that you're to, maybe 0.05 is the tradition, because Fisher did it the first time with 0.05. But it doesn't have to be 0.05. Could be different if you wanted, uh, or if the lecturer said it was, uh, in particular. Um, uh, then conclude that the data you have is unlikely compared to all the things it could have been. And so we reject. that I have no way of saying this, but whatever A, B, C was affects whatever the outcome is. Yeah. I'm going to write that down in a second. All right. So let's just let me summarize this in the order that you would have to say it when you were doing a question in an exam. It would go something like the null hypothesis would be so this is, this is in the right order. The null hypothesis is... Now, the real null hypothesis is that whatever the categorical variable is, it doesn't affect the numerical variable. That's the one that's in your head, really. I mean, the real one that's in your head is this. It's like there is an outcome, which is a number, and it's affected by this category, which has three categories. And we're wondering, does this affect that? That's the question we're asking. And the real null hypothesis is, no, it doesn't. Because 
that's the one that has the simplest answer. There is only one way to not affect something. There are many ways to affect something. Um, and so that's our null hypothesis. I mean, this is the question that we're asking. But we have to pitch it in terms of means in order to do the calculation we want to do. Um, and so we are going to say the mean in group A is the same as the mean in group B, which is the same as the mean in group C, because we've got three groups. If there were seven, you know, same. And you're supposed to say there is an alternative hypothesis, and the alternative hypothesis is they are not all the same. And the easiest way to do it is to write it as an actual sentence. To be, um, actually, I have skipped one section here before I write this. Before you write this, you have to tell the reader what mu A and mu B and mu C stand for. So give me a moment. I'm going to have to put something before this. Sorry. So the question is this. I have a numerical variable. That's how I draw a numerical variable. And I have a categorical variable with three categories. And I'm wondering if they're related or not. So that's what's in my head. OK. So the first thing is to recast this as if it was about means. And so you say, you know, let mu a be the true mean when in category A, and so on, right? For category B, mu C, for category C. So this bit here is what the lecturer means when they say, define your parameters. And then we'll say, mu naught, H naught is that they're all the same. And H A is that the means are not all equal. OK. Cool. So you can see a little bit about how my memory works. It doesn't work in order. And most people's memories don't uh, work in order. Your brain is not a line. It is a squishy thing with all things connected trillions and trillions of times. So it doesn't work in order. Um, and so sometimes you remember it not in the order it is, and you have to reconstruct the correct order afterwards. OK. So you have to define your parameters. You have to write your null hypothesis. Uh, and then you have to calculate your, your test statistic, which is F, which is calculated from table. And normally, if you did one of these things, you'd have to tell the person a calculation. But it's all too complicated. And so you can say calculated from the ANOVA table. And if the null hypothesis is true, then f is distributed to according to this like that. That's what that twiddle is pronounced is pronounced as you pronounce the twiddle as dis, is distributed according to. So the number f is distributed according to the distribution f with this these degrees of freedom. OK. Yeah, totally. Um, at some point, possibly before or after, you're supposed to check the assumptions. I'll do that at the end. Actually, they normally do that either as one before or one after. Or they do, the or they do this first, and then they say, now, check the assumptions. Do you think that was reasonable? And you go, yes or no. OK, uh, and then remind me if I don't say it so that I can put it on here. Um, so uh, then you say, uh, if the p-value is less than 0.05, you're supposed to give them a rejection rule, and then you do it. So the p-value equals whatever it is, and you draw your test statistic, 
and you calculate your thing like that, and then you make the decision. Decision, uh, and then conclusion. And then assumptions. So crap, there's not enough space for them. Let's pop them on the next page. You know, reject. Now what does your lecturer call not rejecting? Retain? Okay. So in, in the statistics course I talked to yesterday, uh, their lecturer says you're not allowed to say retain, and you have to say reject or do not reject. So different courses will have different rules on that. <laughs> Um, and then conclusion. And the conclusion would be something along the lines of, and so there is strong evidence to suggest blah, blah, blah. Or so there is no evidence to suggest that blah, blah, blah. Something like that. And then put something here that's in actually the context of the story. Your conclusion is not allowed to mention the, value, the, the letters mu. It must be about the story that this came from. That's important. Because you created those mu's in order to do the problem. Whoever it was that wanted you to solve this problem doesn't know what mu stands for. So you have to do it in terms of the original question, which was, you know, for example, we said, does the kind of dog that you own make a difference to how much time you spend with it? And we, if we rejected, we might say, so there is strong evidence to suggest that the kind of dog does make a difference uh, to the amount of time you spend. In fact, if you own a chihuahua, you spend more time than blah, 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 or whatever, something like that. And normally, uh, and then at some point, You're supposed to check the assumptions. So I'm pretty sure ANOVA uh, has mm, these assumptions. In my head, they're all just batteries not included. Um, that's, you know, check your assumptions. So there's a little star that says, yes, the F dis the, this F will be an F distribution, then it says star, but only if um, each individual group is normally distributed uh, and they all have the same variance and uh, they're independent within groups and across groups. I believe that's the assumptions for this, pretty sure. So the measurements are independent between groups and within groups. Uh, and you cannot check this with the numbers. All you can do is get it from the story. Uh, you might be able to check it from the numbers if you knew which order they were collected in. So um, if you looked at um, what the numbers were um, in relation to how, which order they were collected in and they just went down and down as you went forward, in time, that means that the later ones have a relationship with each other and the earlier ones have a relationship with each other, so it's not independent. So you could do that. Um, but usually you go with the story and you say, ah oh, yes, they were random samples, awesome. And therefore they're independent. So this comes from the story. Uh, Each group is normally distributed. Um, if I'm right, because your lecturer is from the School of Maths, I would imagine they would do this by drawing like a QQ plot. <laughs> uh, over in psychology, they do the Shapiro-Wilk test. Um, and over in, in economics, they draw a histogram. <coughs> to be fair, 
It probably works fine even if it's not that normal. So no one really cares that much. Uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, and the um, variances in each group are equal. Okay, and I was taught to check this by taking the biggest variance and the smallest variance and seeing if that the biggest one was less than two times the smallest one. Yep, okay, cool. Largest variance divided by smallest variance is less than two. And did you know this is a hypothesis test. Because when you divide two variances, it's an F statistic, and an F distribution, uh, if you're less than, greater than two, then you're guaranteed to be under 0.05. And so this is itself a hypothesis test. And the hypothesis, the null hypothesis is are these variances equal? And the answer is, I would re retain that hypothesis. Isn't that cool? And you didn't even, weren't even told. Um, yeah. Sorry, anyway, it was just, I, did, I, I didn't know that when I learned this, and it was like six years later that I finally learned that that's a hypothesis test too. Um, yeah, because, because we calculate something from our data and we compare it to something to a number uh, to see whether it's earlier or later. We're doing, we're doing it by basically looking it up in a table to see whether it's, yeah, it's cool. Anyway, so if it's less than two, the p-value is going to be above 0.05, and so you retain the hypothesis that they're, that they're equal. It's pretty cool. Of course, you just do this largest and the smallest one, because of course the one that's in the middle, if they're equal, it has to be between them because of the squeeze law. So, yeah, okay. That excites me more than it should probably, but anyway. So these pieces here are the pieces that we have to have for any hypothesis test. Um, you're supposed to define your parameters, define any parameters that you plan to mention when you write your null hypothesis. Write your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. Ca say how you're going to calculate your test statistic. Say what the distribution is if it's true. Say how you're going to decide whether you reject or retain. Then do it. And also at some point check the assumptions. They're all the things that you're supposed to do when you do any hypothesis test. All right. Further thoughts about ANOVA. I would like at least one comment, even if it's, that was good, David. <laughs> good. Okay. Right. Uh, one more, just, 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 just a second. This idea works no matter what process you are using to predict things with. So the, the general idea is to say, what is the best way for me to, to um, tell someone what's the best estimate for what this value is, right? Um, so I have a number that I, that I record from people. So just, just the philosophy of a lot. Each person or object um, has a numerical outcome. And they may have various other bits of information about them as well. Some explanatory variable number one, an explanatory variable number two, an explanatory variable number three, or however many of them there are. And these are allowed to be numbers or categories. It doesn't really matter. And our question when we're asking ANOVA <coughs> is when you have this numerical outcome, which I shall call Y, can you get a good estimate for what it should be that isn't too far from what it really is? Based on the values of these other things. And this is the picture that's in my head, and it's drawn, um, I used to draw it with the Y on this side, but if I draw it on this side, then it matches the way R works. You go Y, twiddle, stuff. Um, so that's why I draw it, draw it that way. 
And that's the philosophy we're saying is I get using x1, x2, x3 any better than just the mean. I mean, that's the question I'm asking. And so what you do is you do those same variances, but it doesn't have to be group mean minus grand mean. It just has to be, hello. Look over there, there's a cool artwork. Go that way. OK, so <laughs> it's a school group. So I always like to tell them to go and look at space filling, mind filling, because it's so cool. And it's my artwork, so um, you know. Um, so. What you do is you compare the estimate you get to the best estimate you have. And so you can even use it to compare two different models to each other, um, even if, um, as opposed to just to the one with just the mean. But basically what you do is you go um, the S, S for the model, the actual value minus the predicted value. Is this what your lecturer uses, predicted value? Why hat? Yeah. So that's this estimate here. So when I say this y hat, that's the estimate I get using these things. So each one uh, minus its predicted value. No, sorry, that's not the SSM. Sorry. No, that's right. Oh. <laughs> this is SSE. So this is the leftover variation that we have yet to explain. It's how far each individual is from the predicted value. That's the error. Um, and then the SS for the model, so that's error model. And this is y hat minus y bar. So this is how far your model, your prediction, is from the best prediction you had before. And the best prediction you had before was just the mean. And when you do your F, you do SSM divided by SSE, and that's your F statistic. Yeah. And that's the big idea of all kinds of ANOVA. They're all based on that idea. And that is why when you do, did you do multiple regression in this course? That is why when you do a multiple regression, the computer automatically produces an ANOVA table, because what it's done is this. Yeah. There you go. So. Right. And so when you're doing, whoa, that's weird. I can't even see anything. Oh, it's because the thing's black. Wow, OK. <laughs> um, so when you're doing ordinary ANOVA, uh, ordinary one-way ANOVA, here it is, the y hat is these three group means. And each person has their own y hat, which is only three options for what that number could be. Um, and when you're doing um, ordinary simple linear regression, the y hat is, the, is the, what you get when you sub it into the linear equation formula. Um, and it's all the same idea. Um, and that's why everything is about that, really. OK. So. Yay. OK. So here's a question. You mentioned two-way ANOVA. What this here is technically is uh, one-way ANOVA. And the reason it's called one-way ANOVA is because there's one way to affect the outcome. Two-way ANOVA has two ways to affect the outcome.
doesn't matter how many categories there are. So because there's two ways to affect the outcome, it's two-way ANOVA. If you had three, it would be three-way ANOVA, but nobody calls it that. At that point, you just say, oh, I did a regression. And the same thing works. So with a two-way ANOVA, technically, there would be six groups here because each group of this goes with each group of this to make six options, and there's six different means, um, and uh, yeah. But actually, you normally say that being in this group adds a little extra, and being in each of these groups adds a little extra. And so the ANOVA table all usually ends up with um, three rows instead of, like four rows instead of three, uh, because you get one for each, usually. Crap. This is where I'm not sure what your lecture is talking about, but that's the general idea. Uh, and some, do you do interaction? Um, and sometimes, this is at the moment the drawing here. At the moment, this drawing is saying that regardless of what X2 is doing, X1 has a certain effect on the outcome. And regardless of what X1 is doing, X2 has a certain effect on the outcome. But it may be that X1 affects the way that X2 affects the outcome, and vice versa. And so I normally draw it like this. Not that. That these two, in combination, have an effect of their own. If, if you were specifically interested in one of them affecting the other, I might say there's an arrow from X1 to the arrow for X2 because it's saying that the X1 affects the way that X2 affects Y. <laughs> but if they don't have a specific order, then this is how I do it. Yeah. Do we have an example from, the, from the, your course of two-way and over? because I could talk through that one. But I could also just make one up. Um, it's boring, by the way. Uh, the yield of wheat is measured uh, on, I'll just pick a number in a second, some number of, <laughs> whoa, <coughs> sorry, sorry to those listening online with headphones on, <laughs> of course you can't hear the apology, <laughs> um, uh, the yield of wheat is measured on this many plots, uh, and um, uh, we were interested in whether um, high versus low watering and uh, pesticides a, B, and C affected the yield. Something like that. And so, oh. mm -hmm. let's say 48, that's a good number. They're little plots, right? In a great big field uh, on a research farm, like the one that we have out at Roseworthy. Uh, so even though the plant science is at White Campus now, um, the, the um, research farm is out at Roseworthy because there's more space there. And plant science used to be at Roseworthy, but now we have animal science at Roseworthy. So. Okay. I know this because I've had to help those students, and I live in Gawler, so I know a lot about Roseworthy. Uh, so, um, so the idea, you know, 
Uh, so there are uh, eight um, plots for each combination of water and pesticide. So this is a two-way ANOVA situation. And so the idea is that we have uh, pesticides A, B and C and, and water high and low and there's six different combinations and there's eight bits of data for each of these. Okay, so let's just make sure we've got this right. This is our plot of, of wheat stalks and we have two bits of information pesticide which comes in categories of A, B and C and watering which comes in categories of high and low and the yield which is the number. This is the information that we have recorded about each plot um, in my research farm and that's how I'm thinking about it. The plot of the research farm is producing these three variables and I'm interested in this story I just have a need to colour these in green and to colour these in yellow because it is wheat. I feel better now. Okay. Uh, so this is the story. Yield, which is a number, is being affected by both pesticide and water. But it may be that pesticide A is more effective when it, like, it may be that high watering gives a better yield all the time. And it may be that high watering, uh, that, that pesticide A gives a better yield all the time. But it may be that even taking into that account, uh, even taking that into account, that having both pesticide A and high watering gives even more yield. That's an interaction. So I'm just going to draw a picture. So this is going to be A, B and C. Whoop, sorry. And then within A, and then within A we're going to have high and low. Something like that. So it may be, and this is the yield, so that when, a, when um, you're in pesticide A and you have high watering, it may be that your eight bits of data are here. Right? Crap. Give me a minute. It's going to take me a while to do this. Um, so it may be that having high water always gives you a certain amount extra, right? So um, it may be that this pesticide's the worst one, this is the second. These two are roughly the same. This one's better than both of them, okay? So the idea is that the mean for this one may be... Um, so maybe that high water is always the same height above low water, okay? So even here, something like that. So this situation... Um, This situation is saying that high water always has the same effect regardless of which um, pesticide you're in. It always adds this amount extra to the mean. Right? Um, and the pesticide always has the same effect regardless of which level of water you have. It always adds, you know, it's always this height. But it may be that it's actually more like this. that, well, based on what's happening over here, I would expect the high water to only raise it by this much, but when I'm in pesticide A, it also raises it by this much. That's the interaction effect. Right. So it's more like, you know, you've got your data.
And so what the statistics will be able to tell us is that high water does have an effect. It's always higher when you're in high water. And um, pesticide A does have an effect compared to these two because it's higher for both high water and low water. Um, but there's a little bit extra on top for being in both high water and A. So this little bit extra here. So this is where I'd expect A high to be, right? But it's actually here. So this extra bit here, that's the interaction. Right. There you go. Um, and sometimes what the interaction does is it makes it lower than you would have expected. And you'll get an ANOVA table that will go something like source, um, pesticide, water, pesticide cross water, error, total. Something like that. And they'll all have F statistics to go with them. And they'll all actually be compared with the error. Um, so they'll all have SSs, they'll all have degrees of freedom, and they'll all have MSs. And then each of these will have an F. and they'll all get a p-value. And that will be an ANOVA table for two-way ANOVA with interaction. And so you'll look at the interaction here, which is the time they do it, uh, and you'll get a p-value there. And if that's high, you'll go, no, nah, no interaction. Or if it's low, you'll say, yes, there is an interaction effect. Uh, because the null hypothesis is always there's no relationship. That's why it's null. Null for no. Yeah. Uh, and so um, normally if it didn't come out with an interaction, you'd redo the whole thing without the interaction there. Um, so because it's not there, so you might as well do it without. And so sometimes it turns out that actually one of them doesn't have an effect all by itself, but there's an interaction effect with the other thing. Uh, there's all sorts of combinations of things that could happen. Um, and I wouldn't expect your lecturer to do this with a three by two. Two by two is hard enough. Um, to keep track of. <coughs> All right. Yep. <coughs> so you're saying what parametric test should you use in what situations? Is that what you said? Okay. Oh, we're only at one o'clock. When am I supposed to finish? Half past? When did I start? Half past 11 ish? Okay, right. <laughs> I don't know. I'm at, this is the last revision seminar of 11 this week, and so I'm, I, I, I have no idea what I've said. And the courses that I've talked about, it was so funny. In Maths 1M, they asked me to talk about, about I can't even remember what they're called now. It's not even worth saying. But yeah, the different courses have the same stuff in them, and they're done differently. And yeah, it's just that's how my life works. And I'm, I, actually, it's a fun job because of that. But just got to keep all the balls in the air. Okay, so you're saying which tests go with which situations? Okay, well... I would like to know what tests you've seen. Sorry? Yep, I can talk about that too. I've got half an hour, so I'll see how it go. But uh, it would be nice to have a list so we can brainstorm, please. Um, what tests have there been? Obviously, we've got a NOVA. That's a good start. And you've already mentioned um, the Wilcoxon... Just a second, is this the Wilcoxon signed ranks test or the Wilcoxon rank sum test? Rank sum? Well, the Man Whitney and the Wilcoxon rank sum produced the same result. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, you're saying there was a sign test, apparently. Uh, <laughs> so what, what about, there'd, there'd be a couple of t-tests, I'd say there'd be a paired t-test, and what's the other one called in your lecturer, in your course? Oh, 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 oh that, okay, we've got three now. So there would be a plain ordinary, there'd be one that goes with two groups. Well, that, that's this one, the matched pairs. Uh, they call it two sample? Okay. <laughs> uh, and that two sample t-test may be either pulled or unpulled, I imagine. Could be wrong. <laughs> Okay, what else have we got? Ah, oh, there'd be like a one sample t-test, you're saying, yeah. And uh, you haven't done McNeema's test, have you? Oh, sad. I love McNeema's test. It's like the paired, the paired proportion test. Because <laughs> so, uh, you know how you've got a t-test and a paired p-test, t-test. Well, yeah, there's a proportion, there's a paired. And have you done the chi-squared test? What are they doing? Honestly, people, if you're going to teach people how to do statistics, you have to teach them the chi-squared test. <sighs> Sorry? Binomial? Okay, that's not one of these. Radio. You might have to tell me that one because I'm not sure how that's different from the other ones. Sorry? Well, it's, it's, it's uh, this one, right? Or that one. But you don't use a Z, you just use the binomial distribution as far as I know. Is that right? Okay, cool. Have we got any others? Because I, I don't, I'm not in this course, you're the people who have to know. There'd probably be at least one hypothesis test embedded in the middle of regression. You know where they say test the hypothesis that the slope is zero? No? It, yep. It is technically a t-test, yes. But just for just for completeness's sake, the t-test for slope in regression. Okay. <laughs> What's that one? Oh, like a Z-test? Like a one-sample Z-test? Okay. Now, I'll put it at the bottom. That's mean. <laughs> they didn't change order. That's good. So now I am understanding your desire to need a way of distinguishing between these things. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you a question, the, uh, the room. Um, what things at the moment off the top of your head could you tell me that make these things different and make these things similar? Don't have enough samples to justify a normal distribution. Okay. What? What 
features do these things have that make them similar and different? Because if we want to know when to use them, we have to know how they're different, right? Um, use the central limit theorem, cool. Um, but uh, ultimately, sort of. Test for when you don't know the distribution. And you said it was like when you can't be sure it's normal. So that's the same thing, right? Because even if you did know the distribution and it wasn't normal, you would still use the Man Whitney one. I think it's cool that Man, it's called the Man Whitney test because Man and Whitney published it in the same journal in the same year. And neither of them knew that the other person was doing it. Yeah. And they had comp different methods for. Yeah, it's really cool. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so let's just ask the thing. What makes um, the, the uh, t-test, like the two-sample t-test, different from the paired t-test, match pairs t-test? I didn't hear, sorry. Variance? Ah. That's what makes these two different. On the same individuals. Uh, so it's about how the data is organized. These ones are two th measurements on the same individuals, and this is one measurement on two different groups of individuals. Okay, so these sorts of questions are important questions. So if, I, I would recommend, if you want, even if I don't cover them all, writing every one of these on a separate piece of paper and then picking two of them and deciding how they're similar and how they're different. And that will help you to decide when to do them and when not. Uh, because if you know that they're different, the, the, if there's only one thing that makes them different, that must be the thing that helps to decide between them. Um, and pretty much all methods, if you have in any course of any kind, mathematical or otherwise, and there are multiple methods, doing that, saying how are they similar, how are they different, will help you make the decision of when to use them. So it's a good strategy, and that's why I wanted to do it now. Um, I have a list of about four features that will help you make that decision. And those features are to do with what you have recorded about each individual object or person or whatever. Um, so features that make the choice. Okay, what kind of variables you've recorded? So whether they're categorical or numerical, or whatever your lecturer calls them. Um, sometimes they call them qualitative and quantitative, anyway. The distribution of those variables makes a difference. how many categories the categorical variables have. And whether the categories tell you to, whether the data is organized as multiple measurements on the same individual or not. Uh, How many times the outcome is measured on each? Um, I actually normally do that as whether the categories tell you to separate people or measure them twice. Um, so it's about the categories. Um, and then finally, technical details about variance usually. <laughs> OK. Right. These, as far as I know, 
are the main features that distinguish between these hypothesis tests. And various, you know, if you look at it, there's one, two, three, four, five. There's going to be at least 32 options for, for what these features, op combinations of features you have. And you haven't been given 32 hypothesis tests. Um, and so there are actually ones that conceivably you could know about, but you haven't been told. And they may come up in, in later courses. However, these are useful for to understanding if you just look randomly online and someone, you read in a research paper and they've used one you haven't heard of. If you go looking for this information, it can help you. Okay. And I normally combine all of this, except possibly this one, into a single diagram, which I've been already drawing, to help me make sense of what's going on. So, variables come in two types. They're categorical or numerical. So it's like categories versus numbers. Um, the distribution of the numerical variables, you can just draw it, right? Like it's either normal or, you know, not normal. <laughs> and how many categories? Well, just draw how many boxes there are. Um, and how many times the outcome is measured for each. Well, it's going to be hard to describe, um, but it's going to, I'm going to have a person or whatever the object is, and you'll see it in a minute. And the variances I haven't mentioned, I'm just going to have to write that. Okay. Uh, because to be fair, most people, when they do statistics in practice, they never use the ones for equal variance anyway. They just always do the one for unequal variance because, like, well, the computer gives it to you anyway, so who cares? There are very few situations in which you can be absolutely certain the variances are equal anyway. Okay, so here we go. Yep, okay, that should be everything. So I'm going to run through these and let's see what we've got. So the one sample t test. Oh, there's one secret one that isn't here, which is the relationship you're trying to investigate. Because some of them, some hypothesis tests me measure a relationship between variables, and some of them don't. It's just about a single variable all by itself. Okay, so the one sample t test uh, is designed for when you have a single numerical variable, and you would like to know if the mean that you're thinking of is a good one for predicting what it is. So is this single number mean a good prediction of that? That's what the question is. And so your null hypothesis, because you have to pitch it to be about means, is, is the mean equal to that number? Okay? And that's all there is to it most of the rest of the information is irrelevant for this story. Okay, it's not about relationships. It's not about relationships. Um, it's uh, that there aren't any categories involved anyway. Um, uh, yes, actually, just a second. This is supposed to be normally distributed, right, in order to do the t-test. And for variances, well, you're supposed to not know what the variance is if you're doing a t-test. I don't know what the sigma is. That's all the information about the one sample t-test. And the reason I draw it this way is that when I have them all on little cards, I can compare them based on the picture instead of just on the list. <laughs> OK. I should totally make a set of cards to have in the Math Learning Center. That would be cool. Yeah. OK. So there's a one sample z test for a mean where you say it's the same question a number it's still normal but we do know we do know what the mean, what the standard deviation is this time 
So the only difference between the situations when I would use one of these over the other is whether you know the standard deviation or not. And that means the population standard deviation, like the standard deviation of all of the, norm, the, 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 the measurements you could have taken. And almost never do you actually know that in real life. And that's why you don't see this one in any research papers. Because you never know. The reason it's in your course is just for theoretical purposes um, to say, well, theoretically, we can distinguish between things based on variances. Okay. Doing well. Doing well. So what have I covered so far? We've done the one sample uh, Z test and we've done the one sample T test. Okay. All right. Well, let's do all the other one sample ones while we're at it. I mean, it's in the title. It's one sample. Um, now, just keep in mind here, I'm not trying to give you all the information about how these tests work. I'm just specifying uh, the features of them that distinguish between them. Okay? So when you imagine a test for a proportion, you're thinking each individual, the thing I write down about that individual is whether they say yes or no. Say so what proportion of people agree with this statement? What proportion of people invest in, um, participate in volunteer work? What proportion of children finish their homework? And all of those are actually questions when you go to the individuals and say, did you finish your homework? Yes, no. Right? Um, and it's always yes or no. You may actually ask them another question. It's like, what kind of pet do you have? And they give you 17, op you know, 17 different options. But what, the moment you say, um, do they own a dog, suddenly it's, do you own a dog? Yes, no. And you pull that out of the information you have. So there might be like 17 categories, but you're just focusing on one of them, and that forces it to be a yes, no. So what that means is about each individual, I'm just asking yes or no. And what I'm focusing on is what proportion of them are in the yes or no category, whichever one I'm interested in. So in that situation, it's the same story as a one sample t-test. It's just that the variable I've measured on each individual is a category and not a number. And I really like to think about it that way. That proportion that you write down doesn't belong to any one person. It belongs to the whole group. In the same way that the mean doesn't belong to any one person, it belongs to the whole group. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. There is a technical detail um, which says, uh, you know, I said technical detail about variances. There's a technical detail that says um, I'm not allowed to use Z unless my binomial distribution is normal enough. And so you sort of have to have N P hat and N1 minus P hat are both more than 10. No, N. Duh, 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 duh. N P naught, which is the proportion in the null hypothesis and n1 minus p0, both have to be more than 10. That's what I learned. I don't know what your lecturer did. That's a technical detail about variances. Oh, I love it. I should put like a star here. It's like the battery's not included. Star, battery's not included. Like star, np and np0 and n1 minus p0 have to be greater than 10. <laughs> okay. But what if you don't know that? Well, in that case, that's when you'd use the binomial one that you mentioned, where you use the binomial di distribution directly uh, because you can't approximate it with a normal distribution. Now, we all wonder these days with computers, why do we ever do the normal one if the binomial one's exact and the normal one's an approximation? All right. Uh, people, know what the people know what the Z1 means because it's been around for a while. So, there you go.
Yep. I'm not on the screen. <laughs> no assumptions. This one always works. This one only works at this time. Uh, technically, the t-test always works too, but you know. So in essence, the binomial test for proportion is to categorical variables as the one sample dead t -te z test is to numerical variables. They're doing the same thing. Uh, this one is saying, um, I, I can assume, oh crap, it's the other way around, this way, it's that way, sorry. These two are similar. I can assume it's a Z distribution because of my assumption about the, the about variances. And these two, I can't assume it's a Z distribution. Um, I'm going to have to use um, a different distribution. In this one, a binomial distribution. In this one, a T, -t, -t distribution. Oh, I'm liking it. OK, doing well. Doing well. Binomial test, uh, Z, one proportion test. OK. So, so far. If I see a situation in which the individuals have only had one piece of information recorded about them, it's going to be one of these. Because these only go with one piece of information per individual. Oh, 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 can I just edit this? It's what kind of variables are recorded on the individuals. So when you think about the people or things, it's what's recorded on them, pardon me. It's not what you wrote down when you wrote the statistic down. So some people, when they look at this, get confused because they say, oh, I wrote down a proportion. That's a number. It's a numerical variable. And they go, I must be doing a t-test. It's like, no. The thing I wrote down about the individuals was a category. Right. OK. Oh, I'm just going to leave a space here. So the two sample t-test um, is designed for when each individual has both a number and a category recorded on them. And I'm interested in knowing whether that category makes a difference to that number. So I'm focused on the number. And then the category has two categories. Okay, And importantly, every person can only have one answer for that category. Not allowed to be in two categories at once. So those categories, what they cause is there to be two separate groups, hence the two samples. Different people in different categories. Yep, how happy they are. Exactly. And so you would pitch that as, are people with dogs the mean happiness? Is that the same as the mean happiness for people without dogs? But at the, the point that you ask them, you didn't, they, they were different. But you could imagine setting this up differently and asking them how happy they were before they had a dog, and then asking them later when they did have a dog, and then everybody's in both categories. That's different. Okay. So the two-table t-test. Um, and if you've got a numerical variable, you need to know what distribution it is. Has to go with a normal distribution. Uh, and if you have a numerical variable, uh, and there should be some technical details about standard deviations and stuff, right? And so my technical detail about standard deviation is that the mean in one group is the, the standard deviation in one group is the same as the standard deviation in the other. And this is the pooled two sample t-test. Because what you do is you say, well, if the null hypothesis is true, then the two groups are the same group. And they have the same variance. So I'll just calculate the variance of the giant group. And that will be my estimate for sigma. But you can actually calculate what that is based on um, the variances you already have um, and, some, and a special calculation. So, OK. And obviously, there's an unpooled one. 
Well, that's when you're not assuming they're equal. You don't have that assumption. I believe R calls this the Welch two-sample t-test. If you look closely, when you do t, t dot test stuff, um, it comes out and says Welch is two-sample t-test. So have a look. I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, because when the t-test was first invented, it was this. And then people later figured out a fix to the problem of the variances not being equal. Not on the screen. Well, I mean, we don't actually even know whether they're equal or not. We don't care. We just do it. <laughs> but technically, that's when you do it, when they're not equal. Because if they were equal, you could do the pooled one. And the reason you do the pooled one um, is because you actually end up with a lower degrees of freedom and therefore a better chance of rejecting the null hypothesis. Uh, you've got more precise information. That's the idea. Okay, so we've gone, done both of them. Good, good, good. So, um, well, I mentioned what if you measured everybody in two different situations instead of measuring everybody only in one situation, but there were two, two situations to choose from. Oh, I call it the paired t-test, but you probably know it's the match pairs t-test. It's the same thing. Um, so you're ready. You're still interested in the relationship between a category and a number. And it's still a normal distribution. But now everybody has had this outcome number measured twice, once in each situation. That's the paired t-test. I find this the easiest way of thinking about what's going on. Um, probably it's worth, I'm just going to worth point some stuff out. The data probably looks like this, that each person, what you measure for on them is you've got this number into situation A and you've got this number in situation B. That's what the data looks like. <coughs> and so your data would probably go, you know, person, person one, person two, person three, person four, the number in situation A, the number in situation B, and then each person would have two numbers. That's what the data will actually look like. Whereas the data up here, this data will look like person, category, outcome. Like that. So the data will actually look really different, but the philosophy is the same. If you go all the way back to what the question you're trying to answer is, you know, is dog ownership related to happiness, that's this picture I'm drawing. And then this is drawing is saying, well, I've measured everyone in both categories and they become headings. Whereas in this one, I've measured different categories for different people, so I need a variable to say which category goes with which person. Yeah. This is the hardest one to talk about. And it's often the hardest one for people to make a decision between, even though they're really different. Um, but it's, yeah. But I find this picture helps me a lot. Um, to go, well, have I measured them in both categories or are they in separate categories? Now, you have only got one of these. You've only got one paired samples test, which is one of the things that makes it hard, right? Because it would be nice if there was another paired samples test, like, you know, what if we had a paired samples test for proportions? That'd be cool, um, where you ask someone uh, whether they agree now, and then in six months' time you ask them if they agree again. Um, and then that's a paired sample proportion, but you haven't been told a test for that. So, whatever. The tests do exist for that. Is there a 
Nope, because there's only it's only one group. Because, and here's the thing, the details um, of how this test works is that it's not actually based on both of these separately. It's actually only one number, which is the difference between these. So it's technically that we actually create a brand new variable. We actually turn this data into the difference, right? And everybody has a difference, and we ask a new question, which is the difference. Is zero a good prediction for that difference? And so in that sense, technically, you could say do a z-test for this if you knew what the variance of the difference was going to be. But that seems unlikely. <laughs> OK? Um, yeah. So this is technically the same as a one-sample t-test. Um, it's just that it doesn't feel that way when you set up the research. Yeah. All right. How am I doing? All right. Doing OK. I'm, I'm committed now. If you want to leave, go for it. But I'm going to finish this, even if you all leave. Um, OK, so what we've done is we've got our two sample t-test. And we've gone, well, what if the people were in the same category, like everybody's in both categories? We've changed this bit. But what if instead of changing that, we change the distribution? So we're going to change one of these features and see what it's called now. So we're going to uh, put a title here, right? Actually, you do have another paired one. Cool. It's going to be good. OK. So same story. Two categories making a difference to an outcome. And different people are in different categories. And nobody's in both categories. Um, and your distribution is not normal. It doesn't have to be this shape, but that's obviously not normal, so. <laughs> okay. And therefore, since it's not normal, we, might, we don't need any batteries not included about variances, because variances are a normal distribution thing. I mean, all distributions have a variance, but uh, the variance tells you which normal distribution you have. Um, it doesn't tell you anything about other distributions. Um, well, I mean, it does, but ignore that. It doesn't help, uh, not in the same way. And so this is a new situation, and you have been taught what this is. This is what uh, the Wilcoxon rank sum slash man Whitney test is for. So it's not really so much about sample size, other than the fact that if your sample size is very large, you don't normally have to worry about the normal distribution problem. Uh, because technically over here, we don't really need this variable to be normally distributed. We just need the sample mean to be normally distributed, like the, the distribution of all the sample means I could have had to be normally distributed. Um, and the central limit theorem covers that. Um, so what, that's why it usually comes out to say you do this when you have a, a larger sample and this when you have a smaller sample. But, meh. There's been enough research in the time since these have been invented to say that you could probably always do the Wilcoxon and it'd be fine. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. It's just that people, you know, it's been around for like 60 years and people are still prefer you to do t-tests because that's been around for 160 years. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe not 160. The t-distribution existed for a while, but the, the actual, most of the tests didn't exist until after Fisher, which is about 1920s. So, yeah. People are really funny about hypothesis tests in, say, medicine. They, you know, they, there we go. 
I don't know that one. So it's the best one to use, but I don't know it. Why don't we just do a t-test anyway? <laughs> okay. So that's that. But what if it was the paired one? And everyone's in both categories, a before and after, or a with and without. That's what the sign test is for. Because in the sign test, this is my understanding of the sign test. In the sign test, you take the differences between them and you just write down whether they're positive or negative. So basically, we cope with the fact that it's not normal by essentially removing the numbers. <laughs> And actually, technically, the sign test is actually a one-sample proportion test. Because what you're doing is, if which category you're in didn't make a difference to this result, then you would get roughly as many pluses as you would minuses. So the proportion of pluses would be 50%. And so you ask yourself, is the proportion of pluses 50%? And that's now a one-sample proportion test. Yeah, so I'm just going to draw that. So you, um, it's like person one, two, three, four, five, you know, the number in A and the number in B. And the sign, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus. And then now we're going... Just a second. Now each person just has a category, plus or minus. And so we now ask ourselves, is this a good prediction of plus or minus? It doesn't really matter. And now it's a one sample proportion test, which is just fab fabulous, really. So you could do this via the binomial if you, if you couldn't be sure of the normal distribution, or you could do it via the z. Um, yeah. I just love it. I just think that's beautiful. And I think it's so beautiful because it's exactly the same as how the t-test, the paired t-test works, right? You turn a two-sample thing, you turn it into a one-sample t-test, and so we turn this into a one-sample category test. I just think it's just gorgeous. Such a clever idea. You really lose a heap of information, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, so Wilcoxon came up with one called the Wilcoxon signed ranks test, where you don't lose all the information. So in this one, you literally remove all the numbers. Um, whereas in the Man Whitney, you at least keep the order they're in. You put them as ranks instead. Um, so the, the Wilcoxon's rank sum test, you, you take the size of these numbers and you put them in order and then you put pluses and minuses on them and you do a calculation with those. It's very clever. I don't really know how it works. Um, anyway. Oh, doing well, doing well. We did that one. Okay. Uh, so that one's done. Two proportions. And then, uh, then, then that probably would be enough. But, you know, anyway, we'll, we've got a note. <laughs> Okay, so in the two proportions test, you have people in certain situations, and then you record a category on them, yes or no. So I'll call these A and B, and people are only one category, and they're wanting to know how does that affect uh, whether they're yes or no for something. And you're specifically interested in the yes or the no, but there's like a proportion for this. You know, the proportion for yes, that's what we're actually interested in. I know that's not technically part of the diagram. I wouldn't normally draw it, but I just wanted to put it there for you. Um, that sort of that's what we're thinking about. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm pretty sure there's some technical details about whether you use a Z or not if you haven't got enough data. But I don't really know what they are. There's like an NP thing. 
Actually, it's probably that when you find out the pooled, the pooled proportion, I don't know if you'll actually call it that, like the p hat. Like there's a p1 hat and a p2 hat, and there's like just a p hat that you calculate from the data. That pooled p hat, if that is n p hat and n 1 minus p hat is greater than 10, then you're allowed to use this, probably. But I would check that. Um, I'm just going to put it here anyway. But you haven't been told what to do when it's not, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So that philosophy with this one, where there's like a combined proportion, is that well, if the two proportion, if being in which group doesn't make a difference to whether you say yes or yes or no, it's just one big group. So the, the best estimate for what the proportion is is what it is from the big group. Yeah. So two proportion test. ANOVA one way. So ANOVA is designed for when there's any number of categories, but in particular more than two. And different individuals are in different categories. And this is a normal distribution. And an all the variances are the same. But again, you haven't been told what to do when they're not the same. Or what to do when it's not normal. But if you did switch this to normal, the name of the test is the Kruskal-Wallis test. And it works fairly similarly to the to uh, to the um, Man Whitney U test, but with three groups or four or whatever. So, I mean, the Man Whitney U test is essentially the T test, but for but for ranks. So yeah, it's called the Crosscut Waller test, and and all of them have a name. I mean, the most most situations you can think of have been thought of. So the only difference between uh, the ANOVA in terms of when you use it and the two sample T test. Oh, where'd my pool T test go? I've lost a page. Aha, right. And the pool T test, these two are similar, right? They're exactly the same, um, including the assumption of equal variance, except that this has more categories than that does. And that's what I meant about comparing them, and the pictures make it easier to do that. And then finally, the one for regression. Test for the slope. Well, it has a numerical variable affecting a numerical variable. And I don't have to draw any pictures of who's in what category because there aren't any categories. Um, but you do need at least one of uh, the, technically the outcome variable to be normal. Um, normal for each level of this one. Uh, and technically you need the variance to be the same at every level of this one. Uh, but that's a little bit difficult to describe, but homoscedasticity, they call it. <laughs> and technically, this is homoscedasticity as well, because that, that's what it means, equal variance. Don't really know what scedastic means. It's a great word. <laughs> There you go. Covered them all. Yay. Yay. <laughs> At some point, I'll probably write a book with these in it. 
There is a handout in the Maths Learning Center within the minute, but I wrote that before I switched the order of these, uh, so they're all the other way, the arrow's pointing the other way. Um, but it was a little few years before I realized I should probably do it the same order that, um, that R does it. Um, and also it's the same order that you tend to write the regression equation, like Y equals. Um, yeah. And I shall stop there. Uh, thank you. <laughs>